Hi, and good evening, everyone. I am inviting Pastor Dave in right now. So if you guys will hang on just a moment, he'll be joining me on the stage any second now. So welcome to the webinar. We're going to be talking about depression tonight. What's up, Dave? What's up? Peace. So welcome, guys. You know, we already have a question in here. Isn't that cool? But before we get to questions, we're going to jump in and just start uh, talking a little bit. So for those of you that don't know me, I am a therapist. I do a lot of marriage work. Um, I'm also a sex therapist. So I'm constantly talking marriage and intimacy with people. And uh, Dave, tell us a little bit about you before we get started here. Um, I've been a pastor here in Michigan for about uh, nine years. In fact, next week will be nine years. Spent 12 years in youth ministry. Um, I've lived my whole life in, in Michigan. This is Michigan, if you don't know. And I've youth pastored here, here, and now I'm over here. Nice. And uh, I've been working with, I worked with marriages as a youth pastor. And that's really where the passion began. Um, working not just with students, but recognizing that the health of the home really stem from the marriage. And so that's where that began. And when I came into a broken, hurting church, I recognized that one of the foundational things, if the church was ever going to grow and move forward, was we had to put a focus on marriage, which is already where my passion was. And that's really where that began. The blog, the marriage ministry began to come out of that. And that's it's just been a thrill for the past nine years pouring into uh, the marriages of Kalamazoo. And our church is now known for having a, a huge marriage heart. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. That's cool. You know, that's so great because you probably know the stats for marriage for Christians really isn't any different than the stats for non-Christian marriages. So it's good to see that you're doing a work in the church and getting people excited about changing marriage. Because um, really, it's that's a heart of mine as well. Um, but I think in general, it's something where our culture really needs to change and understand how important it is to secure a strong marriage because it absolutely affects generations underneath us. Absolutely. To me, the healthier we can get marriages in the community, the healthier the community actually gets. So I dedicate a whole month uh, of sermons. I do a marriage series every year, and we just focus the entire church about marriage. And at first, the church wasn't sure how to view that. But when I said, does everybody, anybody know a screwed up marriage? Invite them on out. And now every year, June is our highest attended guest um, wow. uh, series just because people just want help. Yeah, that's so cool. So when you're doing that, do you talk about depression in marriage during those seminars or is this going to be kind of a first time for this? Oh, no, um, I, I actually deal with the issue of depression throughout the year. Um, I'm a pastor who deals with depression myself. Um, I'm a pastor who helps champion uh, kind of coming out of the shadows that I, I believe the church has kind of thrown over top of the issue of emotional challenges because they didn't know what to do with it or the way that they looked at it or diagnosed it from a religious standpoint. I, I'm the guy that gets up in the mic and I say quite often to our congregation that I'm not just someone that has faced it, I still face it. Mm -hmm. and, and and I know some of you do as well. And so we've been to get a number of people contacting us that have wanted to attend because not only has vulnerability kind of built a bridge, but it may, it's made it a safe place to attend. And so I will preach on marriage randomly throughout the year in fact, starting a week from Sunday, I'm going to do a series called Catching Foxes, where we do a whole series on emotions for which we're going to talk about uh, depression during that as well. So I do it during the marriage series, but I also do it outside of that. That's awesome. Yeah, it's such a need. And um, we talked a little bit before, but of course, anyone listening today didn't get to hear it. Um, but I have heard oftentimes in the church, and I know a lot of my clients have too, that much of depression really has to do with your faith walk. And so if you're praying enough, if you're reading your word, if you're staying uh, you know, close to Christ, then you won't have those issues. And I really hate when people say that because it's just not true. And really, there's nothing in the gospel about that. So I'm not even sure where it comes from. Yeah, I, we almost treat the Bible or we treat prayer like... Um, like it's Cinderella and the fairy godmother, that if you just pray bippity boppity boom, your depression is gone. You can just cheer up. And it's not the case. We, When we downplay our emotional struggles or our spouse's emotional struggles, we're really down, downplaying their humanity because that's part of our humanity is our emotions. And there are some of us that deal with a cloud or a funk. We, we, that's what we call it in our house, the funk. Yeah. Um, it's we, we all deal with it differently and approach things differently. So uh, yeah, I get it. I totally get it. 
Yeah. And that's a good point, too, that it can look different from person to person. And even you know, as a therapist, I diagnose depression sometimes. And so we have certain symptoms that we're looking for. But even from person to person, you can have kind of these lighter uh, forms of depression that maybe feel present all the time. Or you can have these really intense moments that come much more deeply than the rest of your life. And it's just weeks or months sometimes where it feels um, incredibly overpowering. So depression can look different from person to person. And, and people can have different levels of it and still have that funk or the cloud that you talk about. Mm -hmm. It's so true. Um, and that's where when I when I talk with people about depression, we talk about actually getting a diagnosis, number one, seeing somebody that could actually help give them a diagnosis. Because I my fear is the word depression gets tossed out so much and so often that it almost loses I, this may sound weird to say how how special it is, yeah. and we can kind of dumb it down. Well, because um, somebody might be bummed out, they might be just go through just a little bit of a challenging season, and it's not even depression. But we're so quick to kind of throw it out there, or to do the polar opposite that somebody's going through it, and we'll just cheer up if you would just suck it up and go outside, you'll be all better. And we just got to be better about approaching it and helping people through that. Yeah, you're so right. You know, I've I've had a uh, people close to me who, for instance, lost somebody like a spouse, and then people are telling them, you know, months down the road, well, it looks like you're depressed. Maybe you need medication, and it's heartbreaking to me because no, it's not depression. It's grief, and those things are different. Even though with grief you can have these bouts of depressive times, yeah. you're saying it's not the same as having a clinical diagnosis or finding that depression kind of follows you almost. Yeah. They had the commercial for the longest time with the little, I think it was a little circular guy that would jump around and it had the cloud above him and it would talk about the depression. And yeah. but for real, that's how it is for a lot of people. It just seems so ever present in their lives. Yeah, my, my wife could tell you some stories, uh, even in our first position in Detroit, um, where I was just sitting in the car weeping into my steering wheel. And here I'm one of the pastors needing to go into the church. My my parents are on staff with us, and they're standing outside the, the car tapping in the window saying, David, just unlock the car. Come on out. So, you know, um, being in a, a, a worshipful place and having so much joy going on around, but yet feeling like you feel like all the lights are on except for the lights that are around you. You're just sitting in darkness. And I get it. I get being in a stadium of thousands of people and just sitting there thinking, why does my life suck so much? And, and what is wrong with me? And why can't I get out of this? I get it. Oh, man, I get that. Yeah. Wait, so with you and your wife, what are some of the things that you guys have been able to implement that's been most helpful for you when you're in the funk like that? Um, boy, we, we've gone through quite the journey because she's somebody who's never faced it once. And so there is um, an approach that she has had that, that uh, she just didn't know how to respond to it. And so she would just say, I don't know what to do with you right now and walk away because part of my part of the cloud is not knowing how I'm responding. It's like, I can't see how I'm treating people or treating her. And so she immediately would shut me down thinking, well, when he's ready to treat me better. And it took us a number of years to work through that for her to slip inside my skin and see the world through my eyes that even though it was sunny, which we don't get a ton of those in Michigan during the winter and the spring, I, I couldn't see the sun. I couldn't, it's like I couldn't feel it on my skin or in my soul. And so there are just numbers of things that we've done over the years to uh, to begin to see a little bit of a less frequency of it, as well as a less of an impact when those times come. One of the thing was we, we just got healthier in our house. Hmm. Um, healthier, I was, uh, 2005, I made a massive decision that was, I can't believe it's been 130 pounds ago. It wow. was more than just a shape. It was going after health. If you're going after shape, it's not the same thing. But I, we, I recognize that a big part of our humanity is we're spiritual beings. We are mental, emotional, and, and uh, physical beings, and they are intertwined and they work together. And where I, I am a binge eater, um, I am a guy that kind of leans on those things as my crutches. And so 
when I decided I didn't start running at all yet, but I began to change my diet, began to um, watch what I was eating. My pop intake, we're from Michigan, we say pop, you guys might say soda, soda. Um, <laughs> but began to eat healthier and begin to change my the patterns of how I was sleeping and when I was sleeping. And it, would, it amazed me that just the simple physical health and caring for myself and my wife being my accountability with that began to actually take its toll in a good way on my mental and my emotional health um, because I, I, I hated the person in the mirror mm. and it depressed me. I couldn't be what I thought I should be for, for my wife or for my kids. Um, I was coaching football at the time and I was it's very easy to have self-deprecating humor and to pick on myself. But the reality was it was all truth. That's what I believed. And the healthier that I got dramatically affected um, the way that I felt. And my wife was really, I'd say, my biggest key in helping that because she's my accountability. And most importantly, she was my biggest source of encouragement because mm -hmm. she helped me to understand that if I lost a pound or an ounce, it was all progress. And so she taught me to celebrate progress. And so, man, that right there, hearing that from my wife, that positive encouragement, it's more than just a pat on the back. It's not flattery. But instead of looking at me being a critic for where I was at, she was wanting to lift me up even when I couldn't lift myself up. And that was huge. That's good. So the physical you mentioned that's really important. So changed your diet and found that that was really helpful. Um, I know that having like heavy sugars and heavy refined grains and carbs and all that can kind of be um, negative for your mood. So have you noticed that that getting rid of some of that has been helpful for you? Oh, I haven't. I people say when you do away with certain things, you, you'll you'll not crave them. Um, I miss cookie dough. I miss <laughs> cereal, um, sugar pops. Oh man. Uh, but it's amazing how that stuff can just mess with our, our physical sides. And we've learned more over the past number of years about gluten and such. And I'm not, I love carbs. I love bread. I can, I can destroy a plate of pasta like there's no tomorrow. Um, but I've had to learn to have different approaches to those because um, I just didn't, I didn't like how I felt after I ate all of that because it was just, it was my coping mechanism. <laughs> and what I find is um, we all have coping mechanisms. Now I've got, that's why I've got water next to me. I'm, I'm constantly doing something, drinking something, get it in, in me, getting something in me. But uh, it just amazed me that when I got healthier on the inside, again, it wasn't about shape. It was just about my physicality. Um, it changed things. And about six years ago is when I started running again. Hadn't done that since high school and started working out a little bit more. Uh, that actually added to that other side of being physically healthy, equated to some better emotional health, um, uh, mental health, and spiritual health as well. Um, the more I took care of my, my, my spiritual side, it was, again, that just feeds into it all. We are four layers and we just can't forget our humanity is connected all the way through. Yeah, that's so good. I, I totally believe that too. It's all on my website. I'm, I'm all about that holistic healing and touching every piece of the person instead of just the emotional side. Cause we just can't get far if we just try to look at emotions. Um, our brains don't even work that way actually to calm emotions just in and of themselves. The whole body does work as a, as a you know, an entire unit. Um, I like also that you said your wife helped you to celebrate the progress. So there are those little steps and that constant encouragement. It sounds like that she would give you to remind you that you really were making steps in the right direction. Absolutely. Cause when I think about helping to see progress when I couldn't see progress, mm -hmm. Um, encouraging my effort. I think I've got two kids, an 18 year old and a 15 year old. And there's something that I would never do with them is say, here's the mark you have to meet. And if you don't meet that, then, you know, you're a bad kid. We always encourage the effort. And so my wife translated that to me that even sometimes I was making an effort, I would feel like a failure because I didn't meet my own standard coming in and celebrating the progress that I was making, encouraging sometimes the effort when I couldn't, didn't want to get out of bed, um, when I didn't want to get out of the chair, get away from the Xbox mm -hmm. and constantly feeding hope. And that's something that I write almost on every one of my blogs is encouraging effort, celebrate progress, feed hope. And if you can get that stuff constantly going in your spouse, um, there's really nothing they can't conquer. It may not be at the level and at the rate, uh, but to use a cliche, the Titanic does not turn on a dime. Right. And so we don't despise the days with small beginnings and just start small and keep feeding into that and, and turn around is coming. Yeah, for sure. Um, I have a colleague that talks about 
he describes working through situations and really commonly he's talking about affairs when he talks about it, but he talks about working through these situations and how you, it depicts the dog that's going to live is the one that you feed. So you can either feed the dog of temptation or feed the dog of um, depressive emotions, or you can feed the dog that's healthier, which is what it sounds like you're doing. So taking care of the physical health and the emotional and the spiritual as well. And, um, Give me a little insight on what you've done to take care of spiritual health, because I know typically people with depression will find that that can go down, too. So they'll get to the place where they don't really feel like talking to God. They don't want to do any prayer. They don't want to do any Bible reading. Forget any kind of worship music that edifies the soul, because it just gets to a place where that feels almost condemning instead of helpful. And so speak to me a little about that. Well, I think there's a way to approach it. And I've learned to actually look at doing preventative measures when I'm in a good state. Mm. And that is having good habits, good patterns um, that are going on in your life that are part of your everydayness. Um, Again, I I, I don't think just reading scripture just fixes it all. I don't think just prayer fixes it all. But at the same time, building up a good base and foundation in my life of what the truth is to help when I'm going through those modes to make sure that I know that I am always letting truth drive me. Um, and I've, I've heard the illustration, I've used it myself, that your feelings are the dashboard mm-hmm. and they tell you what's going on under the hood. The dashboard does not drive the car. Yeah. It just tells you what's happening under the hood. So therefore, if I can constantly remind myself that what I'm feeling is real, and so whatever I'm feeling, I have to see that as not the condemning look of God, but that's That's the place to actually invite God, that every emotion should be an invitation for me to invite God into that moment. And I always have to let truth trump feelings. That's why like um, right on my wrist, there's like the the left arm, excuse me, the right arm is just actually some tattoos that are reminders of my journey. Oh, nice. And one of my favorite uh, verses is uh, Psalm chapter 42, verse five. It says, why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying the blues? Let me fix my eyes on God, and soon I will be praising again. It doesn't promise a quick fix, but it says soon. Yeah. And what's, what I love is in Psalms 42 and 43, that is actually repeated three times. Um, commentators believe they're actually one psalm, but split into two. Mm-hmm. And so that has almost been the way that I've approached life is I want to get myself spiritually healthy. So when the cloud does come, just like a storm comes out of nowhere, that I've got enough foundation and I've got good patterns in my life so that as that happens, I'm already in a pattern and I'm constantly giving that truth. And I constantly can see that my emotional strains, that's the dashboard. It's not the engine. Mm-hmm. The dashboard and I gotta say okay I know what the truth is because I've been filling myself been filling the well now I've got to draw out of that well and the problem is is most people ignore those moments until the bad happens and when uh, when it's raining is not the time to build the roof you got to build the roof before the rain starts. Yeah, man, that's good. That's good stuff. So I want to just remind everybody listening, you have a chat box here. You can put in anything you want there and we'll try to get to what you're commenting and what you're asking. Um, you can also ask questions and that's fine. So I'm going to read you this question because you can't see it on your end or at least okay. I don't think you can. So I'm going to read you this question and we'll talk about it some since we did say we'd be talking about marriage and uh, mm-hmm. depression together. We'll start hitting on that. So the question says, my husband and I are in marriage counseling. He He had bad depression and on medication for it. The marriage counselor feels that we need one-on-one counseling, not marriage counseling. I'm frustrated. How will one-on-one counseling help our marriage of 21 years? Um, We we were there to deal with his cheating and trust issues. Okay, so a lot of things going on, cheating, trust issues, depression. Um, And I'll start because part of that sounds a little counselor specific as far as doing individual versus couples counseling. Um, So I'll speak to that and then I'll let you help me with that other piece too with the depression and trust issues together. Um, So for for the person that asked, um, Misty, so the reason that counselors will sometimes ask you to do individual counseling um, or, or at least a really good counselor will ask you to do individual sometimes because there might be issues going on that are so intense. The counselor is having a hard time getting you to come together as a couple. So that would be a reason, for instance, if I was working with you guys that I might say, hey, let's do a little individual first. Now, if you're working with someone who's supposed to be a marriage counselor and they're asking for individual, you have the right and really you should ask, why is it that we're transitioning to individual? Our goal is to work on our marriage. How is this going to help us with our marriage? Because your counselor should be able to answer that. So I've 
had instances where I've done that in the past and we'll do maybe two or three individual sessions and come back to couples counseling. And typically that's when emotions are so high in couples sessions that I literally cannot calm a couple down enough to actually talk to one another. So in each individual session, they can air their complaints. We work through it enough so that they can come back into a couple session and talk about that. So my hope would be that your counselor is wanting to do the same thing. Um, but I would encourage you if they're doing something that doesn't feel like what you actually need in sessions, do ask them about that. See if they have a reasoning. Um, and if you're finding that they're not actually going to do the work that you need them to do, it's OK to look for somebody else. And I would encourage you to do that because even if they are a great counselor, they may not be a good fit for you. And so if they're not working for your marriage like you want them to, I would encourage you to look around for somebody that's going to be more helpful. So that's, that's a awesome. awkward piece. <laughs> But that's good. I mean, right there, to know the why, it's good to ask why. Um, I, I've known counselors to make that su suggestion because they're at their limit. Or I feel like they can't help. But that right there leaves too many questions. So I think that's phenomenal advice. you got to ask why. Yeah. And really, if a counselor is at the limit where they can't help, it shouldn't transition to individual. It should transition to a counselor that knows um, how to handle couples counseling more than they do. In yeah. fact, if a, if a counselor cannot transition you to someone else and they want to keep you for themselves, that's a little bit scary. Any counselor should be able to stand back and say, hey, if we're not being effective and if we're not reaching our goals, then it's time for you to be with somebody that is going to be effective for you. Um, that's not good. In fact, I, I consider that the poverty mindset if someone feels like they have to keep you on their schedule just simply because they, they want to make sure that they're um, having you come in. I don't think that's healthy. I think it's much better um, to be willing to send someone on. In fact, in fact, a counselor's job is not done until you're gone out of their session for good. Um, and the hope is that's because you've learned how to work on your um, your marriage or whatever situation you're coming in for. Um, so, yeah, seek other people if your counselor is not able to meet your needs. And even the individual needs that are there specifically with the depression, um, there is some definite help that he's going to have to have that he's going to have to work through things and understand even strategies for him to be able to move forward. And as far as her having some counseling that there, there may be some actually really good wisdom to understanding tactics from somebody who's not dealing with it to know how to purposely navigate it. And I remember uh, just one of the blogs I did on depression, uh, just making a list of things to not say to people who are depressed. I went and, and a church invited me in to go kind of speak to their congregation. And the amount of people that came up to me afterwards, after I gave them a list of what not to say, didn't realize what they were trying to communicate, even though they were trying to help. So even the individual counseling, it's not because there may be a, an issue per se with her, but it may actually help her to kind of come into his world a little bit because forgiveness is a big deal. And most couples that I deal with with the issue of forgiveness uh, is this idea that trust and forgiveness are two different, are, excuse me, they're the same thing instead of being two different things. Uh, my philosophy is we forgive the way that, that Christ forgives us, but we build trust and trust does not get built overnight. But we forgive, yes, for them, but also for us so that we can actually move forward together. And forgiveness doesn't mean that we just put a stamp of approval and that we just trust immediately. But we do have expectations. We have boundaries. You can forgive and still have strong expectations. But there's got to be a resolve to get through that forgiveness while purposely doing things to build trust. And that's where an individual counselor could definitely help with that. Yeah. That's so good. And forgiveness also doesn't mean reconciliation. And so I have worked with couples before where one person maybe is having an affair and they will straight up say, no, I'm not leaving the affair part. I really like them. Well, that's obviously a marriage that's not going to be helped with counseling if someone's actively still engaged in an affair. Um, now, I completely believe that we can forgive and it, and it may mean that the marriage can't be reconciled. Um, I'm also a huge believer in marriage. That's why I do marriage counseling. And I really do believe that that most of the time it can be reconciled, but we have to get to a place where we're willing to work with forgiveness and work on restoring trust and then also work on not being so selfish. And um, which by the way, depression doesn't lead to affairs. Now that person may have depression and trust issues and affairs, but that, but that's not like the starting point of an affair. It may have led into it, but that wouldn't be considered a norm reaction for somebody with depression. So I would hope that that's not becoming an excuse. Like it might be part of what played into those behaviors. I would hope that doesn't become an excuse as in it's somehow saying this is the reason for my stepping out. It's amazing to me. Um, 
that those that deal with the cloud and they go through depression, how they go to what I call their primal love languages. And my wife, I remember um, after going through just a, one of those tough seasons and she was so angry at me for just being so distant during the day. But at night I put my arm around her, wasn't trying anything. I just wanted her touch because I'm a very touchy person. And all of a sudden it just hit her. She says, when you are going through this time, you're actually the things that you act like you don't want it. You really want it from me because you're the one, like I'm the one that's closest to you. And I'm like, well, yeah, it's so obvious in my mind. And she goes, but I was misinterpreting what I thought you were trying to do. Not realizing when we're alone, you're trying to talk because you're a words guy, but you're mostly a touch person. And I've been pushing you away thinking you've been rejecting me all day, not realizing when we're together, it's you're actually reaching out with what speaks to you the most. And so usually when I'm going through that, I'll find her coming behind me and wrapping her arms around me, not even knowing what to say. She's just there and just present, yeah. which is really quite scriptural. It's really very scriptural. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that because I think oftentimes that does happen when one person has depression, there's that oftentimes they'll push without meaning to. So they're pushing someone away, even if why I want closeness, but for some reason I, I can't have you close right now. And so it's almost like these warring um, ideas and thoughts inside the head of the person with depression, trying to figure out how do I get my needs met when I don't feel like getting my needs met right now. Well, that, and sometimes they don't even realize what they're doing. Like I don't even realize I'm pushing her away or I'm saying things in a specific tone. And mm -hmm. so she's had to learn almost to retranslate. It's not what is coming out of his life right now, but what's really screaming from his heart and learning how to step back. And again, it's, it's just unzipping your spouse from the head down to the heel and slipping inside their world and just simply saying, what are they really truly trying to say and do convey? And then how can a response respond in a way that they'll understand. And that's, that's a big deal. Yeah, that is. And you're completely talking about empathy there too. And so your wife has certainly learned that well from your description. And um, a lot of times people have a difficult time understanding the difference between sympathy and empathy. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so one way I like to describe it is um, sympathy is when someone close to you um, or when you know somebody who maybe lost a spouse or lost a cousin or lost a dad and you can say, oh, yeah, I know how that feels. I lost my dad also. Um, that's sympathy because you're putting your own feelings out there and thinking, oh, well, this must be what you feel like because this is what I feel like. Um, where empathy actually goes a step further. So empathy is when you talk to your friend who's just lost someone and you say, hey, tell me what's going on with you. Let me hear from you. And you take your feelings outside of it for a moment. So sympathy is how do I feel in relation to you? So how do I think you feel? Where empathy is really saying, tell me how you feel. I want to know you. And that is definitely a scriptural um, principle as well to really yearn to know that person that you're with. That's so good. I mean, and it will tell you that it took a good 15 years in a marriage next month. That's not next month yet. So in March, excuse me, May, we will be married 20 years. And she'll say it took 14, 15 years to really grasp and understand. We were such different creatures. We have nothing in common, which we laugh at. We love Jesus and we love, and that's just about it. Oh, and we're stubborn. That's a third thing. Oh, there you but go. <laughs> overall, um, she'll say it took us, it took her years to fully grasp and understand the, the idea of empathy because she sympathize, sympathy wise did not get or understand what I was dealing with. And it just took a lot of time, a lot of walks around the neighborhood of just kind of talking things through and recognizing that sometimes Dave's not all there in terms of his, his ability to convey what's going on. And so her idea is, you know what, I just got to try to see through his eyes and understand. And then when I came out of it, she would start asking questions about it, which just developed even more empathy, which was wonderful. Yeah, that's so good. So my husband and I have been married eight years. We'll be nine in July. <laughs> I know. I really know. We'll be nine in July. And we make jokes all the time about how, like, so when we have miscommunication or we don't understand one another um, after we have our you know, discussion and we figure things out, we'll talk about it afterwards and we'll laugh. We'll we'll kind of giggle about it and say, so maybe next year's our magical year when we start understanding each other. Um, yep. 
I, I think often that's what couples are going through. And when I see couples, it's typically there's been this long line of we don't understand each other. And I think that's even more likely to be the case when you have a marriage where one person struggles with depression and one doesn't. It can often feel like we don't understand each other. And that could be on both sides because it's hard for someone who struggles with depression to know what must it look like to live a life where that never bothers you and that's not a concern you have. And so to get to the place where you can really show one another that empathy and connect, I mean, that that's awesome that you guys are doing that. And I think often if couples will keep working with one another and trying to get to know each other, they'll find that those moments where they haven't been able to connect, they just happen less and less frequently the more often they spend time together really getting to know each other. To me with couples, and this is why I tell young couples constantly, it's it's one thing when you're trying and you fail. Yeah. It's another thing to fail to try. Mm-hmm. And so when it comes to dealing with a spouse, it's just keep trying and I can, I've got as, as one who deals with the emotional pressures of, of depression, I have a ton of forgiveness for, for my wife who tries. Mm-hmm. And, and it's one thing to have that. It's another thing that I have a spouse that won't even try. And that's, that's a huge challenge. And uh, marital health is not a destination that you will ever arrive at. It is a constant journey that you just have to keep feeding because every season of life changes um, as you're just kind of going down the road. This, my wife on uh, Monday, she turns 40 uh, mm-hmm. this past year. She'll tell you that she has gone through the most, I would say, emotional trauma she's ever gone through. We've got a child graduated high school this past summer. Mm-hmm. Uh, her young, our youngest is going went into high school this year. She's turning 40. And all of a sudden this whole year, I've watched her go through some things and, and it's actually helped actually develop a little sympathy mm. as this new life change has brought some challenges. And so there's a little, little side of me that is a little thankful <laughs> that she's gotten a little taste. But the reality is I don't ever want anybody to go through anything of, of what I've had to deal with. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. That's funny. Those life changes do um, impact us pretty severely. I actually, so I've only been married, almost nine years. And you just said it's been 20 years for you and your wife is turning 40. I'm turning 39. So to me, I'm like, wow, you guys got married really young. I actually wanted to get married young. Nobody loved me, but that's okay. (laughs) So it took a while for me to meet the man that loved me. So I got married much later, but I also had a history of trauma. And so I don't, I don't deal with what would be considered like a um, a level of depression that would be clinical or anything like that. But just because of a trauma history, I have these times sometimes where I am heavily impacted by things that my husband hasn't done wrong. He like, In any other light, it would seem normal behavior, but things that upset me. So I, I get that piece of having um, difficulties at times and emotions at times. It don't necessarily make sense, but it's how I feel right now. And yeah. so to have a spouse that's willing to step into that and say, hey, I love you anyways, and I'm still going to treat you well, even though you drive me nuts. Like That's a really beautiful thing. And I would hope that others get to experience that as well. Um, so you're right. I don't like when people go through things either. But what I have noticed in my practice working with couples over and over again, is that sometimes going through those difficult places, if they're willing to work through it, they find that those difficult places become almost these pivotal moments where their relationship is actually changed and can be strengthened in some pretty magnificent ways. Well, just like with faith, that that an untested faith really is no faith at all. I think the same thing is with marriage, that a marriage that is untested and untried, really, it's, it's hard to, to say it's a relationship at all, because relationships, the only way it's you, you grow is to actually go through things together. And so to me, um, you know, we're, we're not perfect in the least bit. We were young. A lot of people let us get married that young. We still don't understand. Uh, she turned 20 the month before we got married. Um, we were pregnant six months into marriage and, uh, you know, it's life changed so rapidly and so quick and the seasons changed so quick that it threw us for a whirl. But you know what? what? We're here to say 20 years later, we've come out on the other side and we don't believe that God has brought you this far just to bring you this far. The best is always yet to come. That's awesome. I love that. Yeah. And everybody has their own journey, right? So I got married way later. I was I was in a place where I was mature enough for sure. And um, I was 30 when I, I think 30 when I got engaged and when I got married, I think December. Yeah. So definitely 
No, 29 when I got engaged, 30 when I got, I don't know. I have no idea how old I was. I am 39 and will be married nine years. So y'all figure out the math, but I was, I was not young. And so we dealt with that and we've dealt with infertility in our marriage as well. And so we know what it's like to have some difficulties in those realms. And then one or both of us has been in school almost our entire marriage. So that that's been something too. And so while every marriage is incredibly unique, it, it really is those places of tension and difficulty that cause us to have a deeper relationship with one another. And it is much like our faith walk. The, the, the only reason we can even be Christians is that place of tension that Christ went through and died on the cross for us. That's some intense pain just to make sure we have a relationship, but it's a really beautiful picture of what we can expect in our own marriages too. So to have that intimacy, you really have to have this vulnerability with one another. Well, and I think, I mean, even bringing that up to have a savior that we're told in Hebrews that understands, um, and we've get this beautiful picture. It's Matthew chapter 28, where Jesus, I think it's 28, 26, where Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. And he, and he says, I am sorrowful even unto death. I mean, we're talking about a deep seated, I can't, I can't say he was depressed, but there was massive sadness that weighed upon him. We know that to the point that he's bleeding through his sweat glands mm -hmm. and even his request to his disciples. I grew up hearing that, could you pray with me? But that's not really what it says. He says, could you not just be with me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Be with me. You don't have to solve anything. You don't have to say anything. Just could you not be with me? And I think that is, uh, I mean, as much as we can understand um, the need for each other, but there's such great depth of just being present with your spouse in this thing that just simply says, I'm not going anywhere. I'm right here. I don't even know what to say, but I'm here. Because you don't have to know what to say. Sometimes your presence just speaks volumes. That's true. In fact, a lot of the work that, that I do when I'm working with clients that are suffering with depression, a lot of it really is just being there. Like they're, they're not going to magically feel better because I'm there um, giving them some kind of advice or some kind of guidance. Like really, it is just being there and knowing that you're not walking alone. Yeah, it's it's huge. Um, the scripture says, be quick, um, quick to listen and slow to speak. And I tell that to couples all the time. You don't try to solve the depression. Just be there. Just yeah. simply be there and listen. You had you had three tips you said earlier, celebrating pro progress and feeding hope. What was the other one? Uh, encourage effort, encourage. celebrate progress, feed hope. Encourage effort. That's really good, too, the encouraging e effort. So can you expound on that piece a little bit more, like what that means and what it looks like for those that are here and maybe wanting to know how to help their spouses? Well, sometimes we, we measure a spouse's effort by what they've accomplished, and sometimes uh, we, we can almost look with a critical eye of what didn't they accomplish. Um, wanted you to renovate the bathroom. And I know that you got uh, the floor done, the walls done, the toilet put in and blah, 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 blah. But the shower curtain didn't get up. And so everything is a failure as opposed to, hey, you started the project. I know you've had a long day. I know that you've been working full time. And hey, the project started. And I just want to thank you for the hard work that you put in there right there. Just looking for the simple effort and encouraging that effort again. Look, it seems like the closer we get to people, the longer that we're with them, the more apt we can take them for granted. And sometimes the worst critics are those that know us the most. And so as a spouse, if we can be quick to look at the efforts that some people are making as opposed to the, the amount of work that actually got done, that's huge. If knowing that our spouse is trying, knowing that they're putting their best foot forward, even though it doesn't feel like it. Um, I tell couples that you may not have 100% to give that day. You may only be running at 60%. But if you're giving 100% of that 60, to me, that's what I'm looking for in my spouse. And I can encourage that effort. I, baby, I know you didn't, you, you didn't have much to give, but what you gave, I, 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 I won't take that for granted. That was huge. So to me, just learning how to recognize that, it's why with my staff, with my board, when I do marriage counseling, I make, I make every meeting start with what I call celebration points. Hmm. And now we've gotten so much of a culture that we, every meeting starts off on a high note of celebrating what's been going on. And I make couples do that. And at one point, they just sat in silence and someone said, well, I didn't kill him this week. I'm like, hey, I will celebrate that. Nice. Two people are alive. But to me, if I can get them looking up 
Dave's going to ask us, Dave's going to ask us. Now they are starting to look and they're developing that habit. And perhaps that will develop into a new pattern of looking for something to encourage. I love that. I'm going to start using that. <laughs> yeah. You know, what I usually do is I ask couples, so what have you done to work on your relationship this week? And I, I don't do it all the time. I do it every once in a while to keep them on their toes and <laughs> make them think about it. But I love that celebration point. That's really good. Um, so you talked about encouraging effort, celebrating progress. We talked a little bit about as well, but, but we kind of give some pointers. Look, look to help your spouse see what progress has actually been made, especially if a spouse is dealing with depression. They're not going to see any progress. All they can see is darkness and light. Um, well, more specifically, their darkness. And I can't see any light. I can't feel any light. I can't see any hope. And so if a spouse can help um, their their loved one who's going through depression just begin to see that you are making progress. Guess what? You you woke up this morning. You showed up this morning. Uh, I've started um, doing rock climbing as kind of a new outlet for me lately. And I finally convinced my wife to show up and she's got, she's got a fear of heights. And so she shows up and it took her a while to really get hooked up and actually do one of the most more simpler walls. And she just kept kind of delaying and kind of delaying. And I looked at her and said, baby, you realize showing up was enough. Aww, Just showing up was enough. And she kind of looked at me and I said, that's, that's a win. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, a little bit later, she, she hooked up, she went maybe a third, almost halfway up a wall, then asked to come down. And I'm like, you just exceeded. And, and her, in the, the average human brain, you didn't even go up all the way. You didn't go up halfway. No, 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 no. You showed up. Yeah. And then now you went up halfway. By the end of the night, she had gone up at three times and was oh. looking for the next step. And imagine if we caught our spouses doing something right and begin to recognize the type of progress because that's momentum. And once you get the mo going, it's easy to facilitate more progress. Yeah, for sure. That's so good. And that's exactly what I was thinking when you were telling that story, like just that little bit of, hey, that was enough. Thank you for showing up. Actually encouraged her to do something that she was scared to do before. That's yeah. huge. Yeah. Um, it, it makes me think of scripture where it talks about perfect love drives out fear. Now, the only perfect love, of course, is Christ. But we have it sometimes and we have moments of it where we can really show it. And I think that's a really good example of saying, hey, you're here. I love that. And it, it helped her get to the place where she was saying, well, let me show you more. Yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah, watch this. Absolutely. <laughs> that's awesome. And then celebrating progress. Um, feeding hope. I'm sorry. That's one we didn't talk about yet. So tell me about the feeding hope piece. Um, scripture says that against all expect, well, the, most translations say against all hope, Abraham believed, but it's actually more aptly translated against all expectations, Abraham believed. <laughs> and so to me, if you've got hope, there's always a possibility because I've never met a hopeless situation that God cannot heal and restore. And so to me, if there's always a sliver of hope, Jesus says that that faith the size of a mustard seed, hope the size of the smallest seed out there has got massive potential. And in fact, he says mountains could be removed. In fact, the context of that was there was a political leader of that world that used slaves to dismantle a literal mountain to move it to show his prowess. And so what Jesus was doing was helping them to see something that they could understand and say, if you could see what people can do in the earthly, guess what, with just a little bit of hope, what you can do in your life. And wow. so I tell couples, if there's anything that you can't abandon, it's hope and mm -hmm feeding it. And as long as Jesus is still alive, which he is, there's always going to be a place and a position of hope. That's awesome, man. I love that. And it's funny that that means um, against all expectation that, that that's really what was going on there. Because if you'll look at research for marriage, a lot of times they'll talk about one of the reasons that marriages get in trouble is because we have these expectations of one another, sometimes that are completely unrealistic. Yeah. And then I have a colleague who always calls expectations planned disappointments. So if you're putting all of this expectation on your spouse, what you're really doing is just waiting to be disappointed because mm -hmm. we can't meet those expectations a lot of times. So I love that the hope is the same thing as the expectations. And the, so that you're able to get beyond the expectations that you might put on one another and yeah. live in a place of very Christ filled hope. 
Well, John chapter one, it says that Jesus was the fullness of God in him was the fullness of God. And I've told people for years that if you are going to find, if you're trying to find your fullness in your spouse, you are placing a demand upon them. They were never equipped to solve. So therefore, if you could find your fullness in the Lord, you'll, you're not going to demand it on a job, a a person or situation to, to give you the fullness that you're demanding. And then on top of that, if you can develop good, healthy expectations and the good experience, there's less of a gap for disappointment. And what happens is couples don't voice the expectations. And then they have this experience that's way on the other side. And all of a sudden, this disappointment grows in between. So couples that can bring those two cliffs together will see much less disappointment. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's funny because couples oftentimes have a really hard time talking about what those expectations are. And I think sometimes couples actually don't know what they are until an expectation is not met. And then it hits them that, oh, I was actually thinking you would do this. Um, So, yeah, that open communication is huge, 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 huge. And that's why even with the issue of depression, with, uh, with our subject for today, with expectations, like uh, like the, the, the woman asked the question about um, why do we need individual counseling? For her, uh, there seems to be a forgiveness issue that probably does need some insight and some help with. But having some tactics of knowing what is the expectation of a spouse who's not dealing with it help with the experience that's there. And I think that could really that can really help. And on the other side, he needs to know what are healthy expectations. And, and that way, if, if we can understand what to truly expect and then what to not expect of our spouse, it really sets us up for much less disappointment. We can find more joy in our spouse. Yeah, for sure. One of the assignments I often give, and I think I talked about it on the last webinar, actually, but what I'll give for people when they're struggling in their marriage is I'll tell them, okay, for the next 30 days, you need to write one positive thing out about your spouse. And the reason why is because it kind of gets you away from that place of expectation. So because you cannot practice both, you can't have all these expectations on your spouse and look for the positive. It's like you have to choose which one of those you're going to do. So to get to the place where you can really just look for positive things happening, it lets you it lets you lower your expectations, but not in a bad way, instead of putting them in that place of almighty God, because none of us are equipped to be there except God. And it's so true that that's a lot of times what people do. In fact, uh, Kim Pullen was on one of the webinars not too long ago, and um, she talked about how when we do that, when we put our spouse in that place, we're really making an idol out of them. And once we do that, yeah, and once we do that, we're no longer in a relationship like we need to be. It can't be balanced if your spouse now is God, um, because not only can they never meet that, but you're going to end up disappointed really throughout your entire marriage. I have a hard time with marriages with a spouse placing an expectation for which they're not personally involved. (laughs) I have a hard time saying, well, I've got expectation for my husband that he can only do. Well, he may be the primary one, but he needs the encouragement. He needs someone celebrating and someone feeding hope. And so to me, every expectation should be laced with a dualistic approach, even though it could be one sided. But to me, it's just got to be it's got to be about the we and not about the me. Absolutely. You're so right. Like marriage really is a team approach. And so if you're um, in the expectations, won't let you do that because then it becomes a you approach. You need to fix this. You need to do that. And um, so, yeah, I am all about the team approach to figuring out how as a couple do we do we best handle a situation and really any any issues within the marriage, whether it's depression or anxiety or affairs or anything like that, anything that happens in a marriage, it isn't a you problem or a me problem. It's an us problem. And so every Everything that happens in the marriage affects both people. And so it's always a both problem, no matter who's the one that's responsible for any activity. And that's where depression just really messes with the brain because you feel such personal response for the darkness in the home, in the world. And there's just so much guilt that is worked in and guilt. God does not work with guilt. Guilt is the enemy. The enemy uses to push it down. Guilt will always push you down. God uses conviction to rise us up and to get us moving. And conviction is both, you know, it's for good things and for, you know, of sin, you know, things like that. But depression wants us to think that we are in this on our own and it's all our fault. It's, It's just so much personal responsibility. And so to me, if you're a spouse of somebody dealing with that, it's learning to say, you don't get it. We're together. We are in this thing together 
and we will sit in silence. We will cuddle in silence. We will go for a walk in silence. And my wife and I do a lot of walks on Sunday evenings to just talk about the week. And there are times that we have walked a mile or two in almost silence just because I didn't know what to say. And so she'd reach over and just hold my hand because she knows that touch to me just says, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, that's so good. You mentioned, um, the conviction and the guilt. Can you just touch on that a little bit, how people might be able to know the difference between those two, especially if they're struggling with depression? Uh, I describe it this way. Guilt is like an anger, anger, anchor, and a conviction is almost like a needle. Um, mm -hmm. Guilt puts, pulls you down and like a boat hooked to an anchor, you have the semblance of motion or movement but you're really not going anywhere. You're locked into one spot and it's meant to hold you down and not progress forward where God uses uh, his Holy Spirit convicts our hearts, uh, things that are sinful, things that are wrong. And so prompts us. Uh, I, I think of like a cartoon, Tom and Jerry, where the needle sticks in the rear end and someone's got to move. And that little prompting, sometimes pinching of our hearts that just simply says what I'm doing isn't right. It's, it's not proper. And that conviction is always designed to move us forward in health. And sometimes to deal with something healthy, we have to deal with some painful things. Sometimes to get healthier, we got to deal with uncomfortable things. So I think guilt doesn't want you to move into health. It's going to lock you in, but fool you into thinking that there's some sort of mobility in, in reality. You're still centered and locked down in one spot where conviction, God moves you forward to get you into a healthier place. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So are you being weighed down or are you being pulled towards God basically would be kind of that's prompted good. or pushed. Prompted or pushed. I like that. Okay. Good stuff. So anyone listening, I'm giving you one last chance to ask questions because we only got about 10 minutes left. And so what I'm going to do also at the same time, Dave, I like just in case we shut off because I've had some webinar issues where it shuts off in the last several minutes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give kind of a quick tip, wrap it up. This is what I think you should do now that you've been here in the webinar. And then I want you to do the same. So that way it gives you a second to think about it since I'm springing this on you. Um, so for those of you listening, if you have a spouse, that's dealing with depression. First of all, I would say invite them to watch this webinar. You'll have the replay in your email and it'll be posted on YouTube within a few days. So invite them to watch this and then you guys talk together about some of the key points, what's really resonated with you and what's resonated with your spouse so that you guys can have a conversation about what's going to be most helpful with moving forward on your journey together in marriage. Your turn. My turn. Um, <laughs> If there's anything that I would really prompt um, for you to do with your spouse, if your spouse is dealing with uh, depression or if you're dealing with it, is to develop margin. When I think of margin, I think of uh, a, a scene in a movie that I really am very uncomfortable watching is if somebody is in a sinking ship and they're running out of air and they've got their lips up trying to catch one more breath of air because there's just so little space to grasp it. When you're pushing your life, your schedule, the pace of your life at at uh, at a rate for which you can't really recover, you're you're really going to run into the issue of depression much quicker. So, getting good margin. And I see margin as three things. It is rest, recreation, and relationship. Getting proper rest, proper sleep patterns. I believe in naps. God gave us naps. Jesus napped. We should all nap. I think that we should have good recreation. If you're not laughing, if you're not dating your spouse and going and having fun, uh, I knew a couple that when I talked to them about margin said, what did, what did you used to do to have fun? They said, we used to go to rodeos. I'm like, well, that's a first. Go to a rodeo. Um, and another couple say, well, we just had a lot of sex before we had all this. I'm like, well, go get naked. I don't care. Have recreation. But the, but the other thing is relationship and that relationship between you and your spouse where you're spending quality time together. You're finding good couple time together. Honestly, good sexual activity, uh, making sure you're on the same page, good communication. And the more that you pour into that relationship, you're having fun together and you know alone. That's good. It's good fun too. And uh, getting good rest, that develops good margin. So you have breathing space in your relationship. And the more that I develop good margin mixed with getting healthier, it has made the cloud really less frequent and less severe. Instead of having something that would knock me out for a uh, half week to a couple weeks, all of a sudden it's gone down to a couple days and sometimes just a couple hours. So good, good margin is a big deal.
Yeah, that's good stuff. So I am originally from Texas. That's where I was born. And I totally get the couple saying that they went to rodeos back in the day. Oh, yeah, that's I'm from Detroit. I, I don't know about rodeos. I grew up in a trailer park outside of Detroit, so I have no clue about rodeos. Yeah, well, it it's fun. They have a concert usually, so you get to listen to some music. They have like kids chasing pigs around and catching them and it's more fun than it sounds. They have people like, you know, roping uh, little calves and stuff like that. It's more fun than it sounds, but it's very Texas. <laughs> hey, I, would, I would try anything once. Uh, when it comes to me and my, my wife, we'll try anything once, but but you can just kind of find what, what fits you guys yeah. together. Right. And my wife and I love nature trails. We love walks. We love things like that. Yeah, nature is a big one for me and my husband, too. We like that. And uh, we like going to Starbucks and sitting with coffee and reading. And that's one of those times when we can be together, but we're not going to be engaged in a lot of communication other than reading certain things that we'll share with one another. And then we talk about our books later on the way home. Um, so, yeah, I am, I'm a big fan of finding what works in the date night, the recreation part you're talking about. So, so, so helpful. Um, yeah. Here's the rest, too. Amen to Jesus took naps. I believe that that's um, almost a scriptural principle I should put into my day more often so um so yeah good stuff I, I tell couples that want to work through things uh before i meet with them i will tell them to go on a on a date or two before we even meet and the, the question is well why I, and my response is the same if if couples like each other they're more apt to work with each other yeah. so recreation and your relationship aspect that actually sets you up to want to work with each other yeah, that's so good. I do. I do, too. I have couples do a date night every single week when we're meeting together. Um, I've even had couples like cancel a session with me. I'll be like, OK, if you really don't have time next week, then you do, because we had a time scheduled and you're released from that time. Go on a date. Because, um, yeah, absolutely. Highly important. In fact, all of our research shows that friendship is one of the key components to having a successful marriage. Um, so if you guys watching are not fully connected to your spouse, I would encourage you do whatever it takes to get that friendship back and start letting that be your baseline to growing in intimacy as well. Jesus wrote to uh, spoke to a church in the book of Revelation that says you're doing all seems like you're doing all of the right things or or you're you're it seems like you're doing something healthy, but you've forgotten your first love. And he says, go back and do the things you did once before. And so what won your heart going into the marriage is what keeps the heart. So keep go back to doing those things. And if you can't do those, find out some new stuff. And again, it's not that you're you know, you're, you're failing as the problem. It's you're failing to try, just keep trying stuff. You may discover you don't like, I don't know, chasing pigs anymore yeah. um, or what happens at rodeos, but you may like other things and it just keep trying. Yeah. Just for clarification, if you go to a rodeo, you don't chase the pigs. There okay. are people who do that. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't do that part. You'll watch other people chase the pigs. And I think they like oil them up first or something. So these little kids are running and trying to jump on the pig. And they're, nice. they think, yeah, it's actually pretty funny. But you could put that on your bucket list for you and your wife. <laughs> it's on there now. That's awesome. Hey, Dave, thanks so much for joining. It's just been a lot of fun talking to you. And I really appreciate you sharing your own life and telling us about your struggles with depression and how you and your wife have been able to overcome that. So thank you so much for being involved. Well, keep her in prayer. She deals with a lot. Yeah, <laughs> we will. What's her name? Her name is Anne. And I feel like we just had this conversation like two days ago and you told me that and I didn't make a note, but Dave and Ann. So yeah, we'll keep her in prayer. Um, and for everybody listening tonight, hey, thanks so much for being here. Um, we actually, we have one more question. Let's try to get through it in the next several minutes before it cuts us off. Um, yeah. So it's, how do you balance empathy versus codependency as the non-depressive spouse? Ooh, that is... That is an amazing, an amazing question. Um, and that's where I think I, I would rather be blamed for too much empathy than not enough. I would rather make the mistake with generosity, with the empathy than not enough. And if there is codependency issues, I would, or it seems like that's developing, change up the patterns of it or change up the things that you're being empath empathetic about just to begin to see, are they chasing validation or are they needing validation? So that's where I think a counselor could actually help out with that to help recognize those things. I'm all for counselors. Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of, it's a sign of strength. Absolutely. 100% agree with you. It takes a lot of bravery 
um, and boldness to go into a counselor and talk about the areas where you hurt and, um, and be willing to have someone walk with you. So yeah, I agree. Um, just so you guys know, um, codependency, that term gets tossed around a lot. It was originally used in relation to addiction and family members being at a place where they were basically letting the addicted person get back into their addiction. Um, so they were doing things that would help them. So the spouse spends all their money on alcohol. And so the non-addicted spouse would go get a second job to make sure they had money instead of letting that person suffer. Um, so keep that in mind that codependency isn't necessarily going to be occurring anyways with depression um, as long as that spouse is continually trying to work towards healing like you've talked about tonight Dave um, because there's going to be times maybe where it feels like you take a, a more um, intense maybe relationship role when you're trying to help your spouse out of those moments um, but I would encourage you to know that that's not necessarily unhealthy if it's getting to an unhealthy place it's because your spouse is not able to function without you anymore and then you're now in the place of god right spouse needs me to function and that's not healthy so you want to make sure that your spouse is learning how to function properly but to also recognize that codependence codependency isn't usually a term associated with depression it's more so associated with someone with an addiction of some type that's, that's a good word and I, and any time that i have dealt with that word which is not a lot what per, the person was uh, really trying to convey is I'm kind of done and I'm frustrated and codependency is an easy word to toss out to, to give myself permission to step back because I mean dealing with depressed people is very taxing and it's very trying and it just takes a lot of patience love and it takes a lot, a lot of just leaning on God to help get you through those moments. Yeah, absolutely. And also as a reminder, if you're the non-depressed spouse, you still need to be engaging in self-care activities too. So you still need to be taking care of yourself, especially if you're often in the role of taking care of your spouse. So please don't neglect um, making sure that your needs are being met. Um, just because you're meeting someone else's. So if that means hanging out with your friends, the same tips you listed, actually, the rest, the relaxation and the recreation, all of those apply to the non-depressed person as well, too. So make sure that you're also doing those things. And if your spouse is unavailable because of a deeper depression for them, love on them and then also spend some time with friends that can love on you during that time. Yeah. That's a good word. So. All right, guys. Well, it has been a pleasure. Like I said, you'll get the replay soon. Um, you'll also see this on YouTube. You can share it with whomever you choose, especially once it's on YouTube. Um, but bless you guys. Dave, when I close off the broadcast, it's closing you off as well. So once again, thanks so much for being a part of this. I've really appreciated you. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for having me. This is awesome. Sure thing. All right. Well, everybody have a good night. God bless and blessings on your marriage. Bye. Bye.